let's continue right here. And now we're gonna talk about, now that we kind of discuss bonds, right? We're gonna talk about double bonds right here, what they are, polar and nonpolar, and why having polarity is important. Remember, one of those things that I want you guys to also remember with, right, water is this, all right? What happens when you put salt and water together? Right? Remember I said that you shouldn't see crystals anymore. Why? Well, water has all those partial charges. And when the partial charge of water, the oxygen has a partial negative charge. Well, the partial negative charge of water, the oxygen part is gonna have, is gonna face sodium. The partial positive charge found in hydrogen is gonna face chlorine. And what we're gonna see then is something that looks like this when we put sodium chloride together, right? When we see sodium chloride, I'm gonna clear this, hopefully this works, right? When you see sodium chloride, right? You have sodium here that's positively charged. You have chlorine here that's negative. Yellow might be a little much. Um, you have chlorine here that's negatively charged. And what happens is this, when you add water to the mix, water also have partial charges. And that's what we'll see next, right? The partial charge of water, the oxygen right here. Oxygen, partial negative. It's gonna surround all the sodium it's gonna then separate sodium from chlorine so then they can't interact with each other, all right? So all these little dots are oxygens with its partial negative charge. Uh, I'm choking on this, all right? And now the chemical name for what we're gonna talk here when it kind of surrounds it, we are. this is called solvating it. All right, we're solvating the oxygen, I mean the sodium and chloride away from each other. We're kind of putting a cage around it. So then those two can't interact with each other. Now let me just put the hydrogens in and then you're gonna see what I mean by surrounding it, all right? So all the positive charge of sodium attracts the partial charge of the partial negative charge of oxygen in water. And same thing with hydrogen. And now, what have we done? That, yeah, that kind of messes one up. It should be hydrogen over here. But again, that's why I hate the whiteboard on here and Zoom. But you get the point right here, right? That the partial charges in the polar covalent bonds found in water separates the hydrogen, I mean the sodium from the chlorine. As it does that, well now sodium and chlorine can't get next to each other physically to form the salt. So as long as there's water available, sodium and chlorine cannot interact with each other because you have all the water molecules surrounding each of the chlorines. So here for the chlorine's negative charge, then the positively charged, partial positive charge, hydrogens in water are gonna surround it, right? So then both of these, the, both of these atoms will then get separated. The sodium and the chlorine are separated by molecules of water right here. They can't reform. What happens if the water is removed? If the water is removed, then there's no more boundary or border. You don't have water in the way. So then the sodium and the chlorine can reform again, right? And you can have crystal. So what happens with salt water? And we do do it, right? You guys have probably seen like the real expensive salt, the Mediterranean sea salts, the Himalayan sea salts. 
Well, they get those sea salts, especially the Mediterranean one from the sea, the Red Sea around there. And what they take is they take salt water and dry it out in the heat. And then when you dry out that salt water, you remove all the water. As you remove all the water, what happens? After I just did all that, I'm gonna erase it. <laughs> As you remove all the water, then the sodium and chlorine can interact again. And now you see the salt crystals, right? Water is special because it can, it can, it, it forms a solubility with all of these, right, charged particles. By the way, right, most of you guys have heard of an electrolyte. So if you watch a TV show, if you watch commercials, right, they always talk about, yes, take Gatorade. It's good because you have electrolytes you're putting back in. Do you guys know the difference between an electrolyte and a salt? Right here, there's no real difference, right? Electrolytes are salts where you put water in there. So let me ask you, right? Would you buy Gatorade if I said, and I try to sell it to you, instead of replacing the word electrolytes, instead I use the word salt. Would you buy it? Would you buy salt water with a little bit of coloring and a little bit of sugar in there? That's Gatorade. And actually that's also Pedialyte, right? But when you hear salts and you hear electrolytes, they mean the same thing, right? What's the difference? One is without water, salt. Once you put salt in water, it turns into electrolytes. Again, right? Now, most of you guys are gonna think, oh my God, you know, Dr. Lee's crazy. Of course you should drink Gatorade, right? They said it's supposed to help all that potassium. Now, if you take a look at your bottle of Gatorade at home, I want you to look at how much sodium it has versus potassium. Potassium at high doses can really cause difficulties for the heart. So normally people don't want to give high potassium in their type of salts that they produce. So Gatorade, Powerade, to give it that salty flavor, they're not gonna put a lot of potassium chloride in there. It's too dangerous. So instead they put a lot of sodium chloride. The actual thing that's supposed to help in Gatorade is not the electrolytes, it's not even the water. It is the sugar found in it. It's a glucose, right? The glucose found in Gatorade is what gives you the actual burst to continue and to go on. Now, if you're exercising like in running a marathon, you might lose enough salts, then you might need the electrolytes. But if you're playing basketball, right, with the start and stops, usually, if it's just one game, you usually, right, it's more the glucose that helps the performance. Now, solubility is what we just mentioned, right? Solubility is the ability of one substance to dissolve in another. Salt in water. Why is it that, all right, when you have, a, and you can even see it like certain places, they have little chunks. And you, like I mentioned, like the expensive salts, they're like, some of them are pink, some of them are blue, it's kind of cool, all right, but they're expensive and they're like bigger crystals. And you put water in there, event, you know, the crystal goes away. Why does a crystal go away? It's because of the activity of water, right? And you can see, and it can, you can see how it's drawn a little bit better here. The red is the oxygen from water. The small blue ones are the hydrogens in water. And the red oxygens have partial negative charge, attracting or being attracted by the full positive charge of sodium. Chlorine has negative charge. That negative charge is gonna attract all these partial, partial positive charges found in the hydrogens of water. So each of the components of water then separates the sodium from the chloride. As you separate them, you dissolve it. And now you dissociate those two. As you dissolve it, now you have positive charge, negative charge. This was a salt. And now by separating it, it turns into an electrolyte. What's the difference between salt and electrolyte? Nothing, a little bit of water, that's it. All right, review these for the quiz. Now, 
What we're gonna mention now are just reactions for a little bit, right? And we're gonna talk about the four main types of, uh, of macromolecules for a little bit. And then we'll stop in about 25 minutes, right? We're not gonna go into too much of the details for reactions again. Most of you guys have hopefully taken chemistry previously. Uh, that was just kind of a rough introduction back to you guys. Now we're gonna see how the chemical reactions are gonna be seen in the body, all right? So let's talk about in general, in a chemical reaction, what do we normally see? In a chemical reaction, so here's one example of a chemical reaction. This is what we call a synthesis reaction. In a synthesis reaction, you're synthesizing something. You're taking something that's small, adding something else small to make something bigger. Here, you have one amino acid, you add another amino acid, and then you form a larger structure. We call it dipeptide. Now, eventually these dipeptides, we're gonna add another amino acid to it. We get a tripeptide. That tripeptide, we add another amino acid. Eventually we add so many different amino acids, we make a protein. But this is the start of our protein formation, right? We take one amino acid, add it with another, to form the initial dipeptide of our protein. A protein might have a thousand amino acid. It might have 40, 50 amino acids. Different proteins have different combinations of the 20 amino acids and different numbers of total amino acids. How they interact, how they form structures and shapes will then allow that protein to function. So here is a synthesis reaction. Synthesis reaction are anabolic reaction. Think about anabolic steroids. Do people get bigger on anabolic steroids? Yeah, they better, right? You gotta be doing something wrong if you're on anabolic steroids and getting smaller. So anabolism is building up. Now, it doesn't have to be a steroids, or I'm just giving an example of this, right? Here, one amino acid added to another eventually adding more and more amino acids to form a protein. In an anabolic reactions, chemical bonds are made, and then the energy is stored in these bonds. Remember, when we are combining in a covalent bond, here's that bond right here that we're forming, right? When we have synthesis reaction, we remove water from the equation. So here's the OH and here's the H. We're gonna remove these two components to form, then the product is water here, and then the carbon on this side, and then nitrogen on this side, fuse together and bond. We call that a peptide bond. Bonds are incredibly important because they're sharing of electrons. And when you break apart a bond, they release a lot of energy. Because when you break a bond, you're releasing electrons. When you're releasing electrons, you are going to release energy. When you make something like this, right? Here, we're making something bigger, right? Are we breaking apart a bond? No, we're actually forming it. Usually that we have to put energy in there. And it kind of makes sense, right? If you have something smaller and you have to make something bigger out of it, it's gonna take a lot more energy for you to do, to make that something larger. Same thing here. Uh, usually it's a type of dehydration production, right? A de dehydration reaction. This is how the body will use small components like amino acids and form larger components like proteins. It's a way of taking glucose. You guys have all heard of blood glucose count, right? It's our way of taking the glucose in our bloodstream after we have eaten a nice balanced meal you're gonna have a lot of glucose in your body. Well, some of that glucose needs to be stored for the future. Remember, our body has always had that kind of constant where during times when you're eating, you want to overeat. So then you can store. So then when you're not eating, you have things in storage you can break apart, right? That's exactly what our body wants. That's why it's so hard to eat without overeating. That's my excuse for never losing weight, right? 
So what we want to do in our body is to produce a lot of things that we can store. So then when we don't have food available, we have the fat that we have produced. We have the glycogen that we have produced. So then if we're not eating, we have that available. We can break it apart and turn it into glucose. So then we can survive when there are times when there's no food, right? So when there's times of plenty, we overeat. So then we can store it for times when there is no food. Perfect, right? That's perfect, except for within the last 50 years, 100 years. In the developing world, right? We don't really see this issue yet, but in our America, in our Western society, like even in Asia now, right? There's a lot of people who are obese. The problem is this, right? We haven't really evolved in the last 50 years. Nobody can evolve that fast, right? To the point where now we have food available to us just about any time. It might not be the best food for us, but it's available. So you eat and as you eat, we still have that thought process of, okay, we got to eat and then store for when we're not eating. So you eat and usually overeat. And instead of maybe a hundred years ago, there might be a 24 hour span. There might be two days where there's really no food available. So then you're breaking apart all the stores of fat and glycogen that you've stored. Well, now we can eat anytime we want. So that food that we stored never gets broken down. And now you eat your next meal. And now instead of breaking down the old storage of fat, you produce even more storage of fat and you accumulate more fat and glycogen, right? Glycogen is going to be how we store carbohydrates, our sugars. And we'll talk about how carbohydrates can sometimes get turned into proteins or more importantly, how carbohydrates can get turned into fats. And again, behind all of this is a thought process that yes, you want to eat and even slightly overeat so then we can have more synthesis reactions. Now, to balance it up, we have catabolic reactions or decomposition reactions where we take something larger, right? Here's a disaccharide, two sugars. We break it apart into two glucose molecules, right? Taking something larger, breaking it apart, catabolism. The combination of all of our anabolic build up reactions and our catabolic breakdown reactions gives us metabolism. So if we have more catabolic reactions, we're breaking apart more of our macromolecules, more of our storage. Usually that's when you are going to lose weight, right? And if you have more anabolic reactions, more fat being produced, more proteins being produced. If you're working out, well, if you have more anabolic reaction than catabolic, then we're gonna build more and we're gonna gain more muscle mass. Right. So I'm not gonna to ask too much about the actual, you know, energy, things like that. That's a little bit too much in chemistry and physics. I do want you to know what is ATP, right? ATP is our body's battery. It's our way of producing stored energy and then using it when we need it, right? The last thing we need to do is just use, you know, the electrons, right? I said electrons are energy. That's how we produce energy in ourselves. But electrons is also a, what we call a free radical. It's harmful. It's damaging. It can cause mutations in our cells. It can cause mutations in our DNA. So you don't just want those free radical electrons just laying around you want to trap it in the stable form so then you can use it whenever you need to. That's what ATP is. ATP is our way of storing the energy in an electron that we just produced, storing it safely. And then when we need it for a chemical reaction, then we release the electron at that time. Perfect, right? It lessens the chance of that free electron roaming around our cells causing damage. That's why ATP is so important. It's our way of storing the energy that we made and then releasing it in a safe focal way when we are 
requiring it. Right. Let's talk about water. And then some uh, different combinations of medium and everything. Water, because of all the hydrogen bonds, the intermolecular forces, has cohesion adhesion properties, meaning that it sticks, right? The adhesion means when you are trying to pour water from one glass to another, how many times do we try to pour it and we just try to eyeball it? And as you try to eyeball it, a little bit of the water kind of sticks to the side and a little bit of it spills out. That's a, because of the hydrogen bonds, right? As water has all those different billions of molecules of H2O, some of the molecules are going to be at the sides, right? And they're gonna form hydrogen bond with the glass on the sides of our container or the plastic or whatever kind of container we're using. 60% of the body, and again, this is all dependent on body size, age, right? Kids, babies, infants who are kind of slightly chunky, right? Have a lot more body, uh, have a lot more water in their body. Now, the big one says 92% of blood is water. The rest is gonna be combination of cells, salts, proteins, right? Things like that. But 92% of blood is water. Water has high specific heat. Because of that high spe st uh, specific heat, it stabilizes our body temperature. So then when you go outside and it's not, you know, it's really cold, right? It's like minus, well, let's just say, let's say it's like zero degrees outside. Well because of the high specific heat of water throughout our body. We don't go from a body temperature of 98.6 to zero, right? We have other ways to kind of, you know, stabilizing the body temperature and the amount of water in our body helps with that. Also allows us to lubricate, cushion, and takes place and participates in lots of chemical reactions. With anabolic reactions, we remove water, from the reaction for catabolic, when we have glycogen and we wanna break it down to glucose, we're gonna add water. Now, glycogen, we'll talk about in a second, is gonna be very important. And if you've ever had a son or daughter, or if you played sports in high school and during a sport or a couple of days before the game, before a meet, before a match, right? A couple of days before your coach tells you to eat pasta. Well, that is what we're trying to build up when we're eating pasta. We're trying to build up the amount of glycogen in our skeletal muscles. So then you have lots of glycogen. You can break it apart when you are in the competition. And now your muscles have all the sugar it needs. So then you can continue to participate. You can continue your match without just tiring out. There is kind of a, a bad thing that can happen though. All right, know the difference between a mixture and a solution. Now, a mixture, substance is physically but not chemically combined, right? A mixture is two different forms, a suspension and a colloid, right? Suspensions, materials separate unless stirred. Example. They talk about sand and water, right? Whoever mixes sand and water in a solution, in a cup, not really in Wisconsin, right? The better example is this, freshly squeezed orange juice. When you have freshly squeezed orange juice or any orange juice with pulp, what happens? Well, if you let it rest for a couple hours, all that pulp being heavy falls to the bottom. So if you want just like kind of real watered down orange juice, you don't mix it. If you want to kind of have an even taste of orange juice, right? Before you take it out and before you serve it, you have to mix that freshly squeezed orange juice. Now, even more importantly is with antibiotics, right? When you, you have little infants and they get sick, the doctor is gonna prescribe antibiotics. And since they're infants, they're not gonna be able to swallow a pill. So what happens, right? You go to the pharmacist. The pharmacist then has a little container of the antibiotic and it's a solid. The pharmacist will add some kind of flavoring agent and then add water to it. As you add water to it, 
the, the pharmacist will then kind of shake it. As you shake it, the antibiotic should be dispersed throughout the whole container. If you take a syringe and go from the very top of the container, there be, should be the same amount of antibiotic drug at the top than at the bottom because you've shaken it so well. But if you wait a couple hours after you get home, the, right, the pharmacist has already shaken it, you have to go to work, now you wait until you're done with work, you wait five, six hours. Well, all the antibiotic drug now falls to the bottom. Very little is gonna be at the very top of the solution. Why? Because the antibiotic drug is gonna be heavier than water. It's gonna to fall to the bottom because of gravity. If you were then to take a syringe and remove the fluid at the top, that fluid on the top has less of the antibiotic drug. What you would need to do then is actually shake it first before any time you're gonna give the antibiotic to your baby, right? That way you disperse the drug evenly and no matter where you put the syringe, right? To pick up the medicine, no matter where you put it, you put it at the top, you put it at the bottom, you should have equal amounts of the drug. A colloid is something that doesn't need to be shaken. Think about milk. I have friends that shake milk and I ask them why they shake milk, All right? You shouldn't need to shake milk. Milk is a colloid. They're going, right, because it's got fats and glucose, right, the fats are going to be very light. And because of that, it's gonna be evenly dispersed throughout the water found in milk. So you wouldn't need to shake it. All right, the last one right here, a solution, mixture of liquids, gases, or solids that are, uniformly distributed and chemically combined. In a solution, the solvent is the fluid part and it's almost always water, right? Water is the universal solvent. That's why water is so important. Now, a solute is any solid, right? That dissolves when mixed with the water. So when we talk about Gatorade, Gatorade is a solution. The water is a solvent. The solute is a sodium chloride, the potassium chloride, and the glucose. They have other kind of crazy stuff for food coloring, but those are all the solutes that are found in the solvent. Ah, all right. Know those differences, all right? And you will hear me and most doctors for, in terms of a solution, we need to have a certain concentration and know what that is, right? Concentration is a number of particles of that solute per volume of solution. You guys have heard of having, right, uh, diabetes and somebody has a blood sugar of 150 milligrams per deciliter. Right, that's a concentration of glucose in one deciliter of blood, right? That's a concentration. So concentration is the amount of that solute in a volume. Now, the weird thing is this, clinically, you're gonna see, there's one of the first instances where we use different language, right? Now, there is a difference between osmolality and osmolarity. Osmolality is the number of particles of a solute in a kilogram of water. We don't really use osmolality in medicine, right? We use this, osmolarity, number of particles in a liter of water. Why? If you've ever seen bags of saline, the bag of saline is one liter, right? It will tell you the amount of that solute and it will write it out already. Why do you want to go find a scale and then weigh it again? Doesn't make sense, right? In order to get osmolality, you know you need to know the weight. So what's the point of that? When they're already giving you the osmolarity, they're already giving you the number of particles and the bag has already told you is in one liter of water, right? That's why we prefer to use this term in medicine. It's one of the, right, one of the first instances, but definitely not the only instance where we'll see there's a difference 
in wording between what we see in academia and what we see in a clinical setting. Right now, usually in our body, we don't have whole like one mole of something is in osmolds, right? And again, to, uh, next week we'll kind of discuss a little bit about uh, diffusion. We're going to talk about osmosis and all that, right? Keep in mind that when we discuss those, it refers to movement of solutes, and in order for solutes to move, we need to know the concentration of the solutes. And usually in our body. 300 is a magic number. 300 milliosmoles is an average concentration of fluid, of solutes when we see it in fluid in our body. So in our body, we're gonna see fluid or water in plasma. In plasma, when you have all the salts, all the proteins, all of the cells added together, this is the concentration of those solutes. 300 milliosmoles, right? Now, inside our cells, we'll also see water. We'll have different proteins, different concentration of salts. But when we measure the concentration inside the cell, it should also be close to 300 milliosmoles. That's the number of total particles of solutes found inside the cell. If we find we're at 300 in each of the areas, then there's no concentration gradient, right? There's no concentration difference. 300 inside the cell, 300 outside the cell. Perfect equilibrium, right? That's gonna be very important as we talk about it next week. All right, acids and bases, keep in mind, right? Acids, and I think this will be the last thing that I'm going to discuss, right? Is acids and bases and then all right, please review the rest of the PowerPoint and the notes and the videos, right, for the macromolecules. We're not gonna have time in two hours to go through the whole chapter, right? So only things that we can go through the rest, you guys have to kind of go through, right? <clears throat> um, when you're looking at pH, all right, in terms of acidity, Keep in mind an acid is anything that is a proton or hydrogen donor. Hydrochloric acid, very strong acid. No matter where it's at and what solution it's at, when we have hydrochloric acid, it's going to release a hydrogen. Whoops. I didn't get that. All right, I hate Siri. <laughs> All right. So it's gonna release a hydrogen and turn into this. So an acid is anything that can give away a hydrogen or deprotonate. Hydrochloric acid, very strong acid, right? Now, a base is anything that can accept a hydrogen, right? So it's a hydrogen acceptor. Probably the better, best example that we have seen is something that you might have seen before, Tums. Tums is a base. So if you have you know, stomach pain, right? And you have acid digestion, and you might have GERD even, and you take Tums, Tums is calcium carbonate, right? With calcium carbonate, that turns into this. I'm not writing the whole chemical formula, it's okay. All right, this, CO3. All right, it's got two negative charge. Carbonate does. And because it's got two negative charge, right, what happens? It's got two negative charge. In our stomach, we have lots of hydrogen and that hydrochloric acid can get sopped up by the calcium carbonate. And now I've removed hydrogen from your stomach, right? Without the hydrogen, it is the hydrogen that causes damage to the lining from the hydrochloric acid. So now that hydrogen is no longer present, right? That hydrogen then gets added here. And now, I have this.
right? So a base is anything that can remove hydrogen from solution. Carbonate can, add, can remove hydrogen from solution. Not only that, when we add all those together, right, we can add and remove two hydrogen molecules from our solution. So that base will then neutralize the hydrogen. And as a base neutralizes that hydrogen, it allows us then to get rid of that acid. And if you have a stomach ache, right, from acid digestion, you need to get rid of that hydrogen. This is how, why Tums work. Tums is calcium carbonate right here, All right? A salt is what happens when you add, right, a base and an acid together, right? Now, when we talk about an acid, keep in mind, a strong acid has a lot of hydrogen, right? Now, the higher the concentration of hydrogen, there's an inverse relationship between hydrogen concentration and pH, right? And in a direct relationship means that when one goes up, the other goes up. An inverse relationship means that as a concentration of something goes up, all right, the measurement of the pH goes in the opposite direction. It goes down. That's what we see here. The higher the concentration of hydrogen, as it goes up, the pH goes down. It's weird because, all right, there is, that inverse relationship. So the more hydrogen, the lower the pH, the stronger the acid. Keep in mind though, a strong acid like hydrochloric acid can burn us just as easily as a strong base. Everybody thinks like strong bases, they can't really do much, right? Lye, oven cleaner, sodium hydroxide, it will, all right, it will burn you just as easily as hydrochloric acid and it will hurt just as much. So don't think that, you know, because we all are scared of acids, right? But strong bases can easily cause damage to us as well, right? Now to also take a look that blood is not exactly neutral. It's slightly basic, 7.4. I will stop right here, it's two, uh, one o'clock already. I want you then for the rest of the remainder of this week to review the organic chemistry parts right here. We'll talk about this, watch the video, All right? Next week, we'll kind of touch base on protein structure and go right into chapter three next week. So uh, you have your to-do list, uh, start doing the connect. Remember, it's based on completion, not correct answers. I will post this